Hello, uh, welcome. We'll uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, Wednesday, April 16th, uh, Audit Committee meeting. Uh, we need a motion to approve the minutes. Anybody? So moved, Aguilar. Second, Rolfing. We have a motion that's been seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Very good. We'll head in uh, right into the reports and updates. Uh, Rich, you want to start us off? Yeah, we have uh, from our external audit firm, uh, Dean Bucknerberg, a partner, and I think we're going to get Brian Stavinger on the phone. Um, Denise is going to get him on the phone. He's the partner in Fargo. Is that right? Correct. Um, now, I understand the CAFR is not ready yet, but you'll have anything you want to discuss with us? Okay. Yeah, put him on. Come on, one more. Um, he can hear us through the microphones. This is Brian. Hey, Brian, how are you? Hey, doing good. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, Brian, Greg Jamison with the Audit Committee. Uh, we're here uh, in our meeting. Are you available to talk? I sure am. Very good. We're just started. Uh, we're looking for an update, I guess. Apparently, the CAFR is not done, but uh, do you have any comments for us? Is, uh, Dean, is, is Dean, Dean is here. There? Dean said he wasn't going to be able to be here. <laughs> no, I'm here, Brian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dean, my, can I go ahead? Yes. My, my name's Dean Bucknerberg. Uh, I'm engagement partner. Uh, and Brian is an audit partner, so we wanted to make sure that we had him available. It's a little difficult being on the phone, but if any real technical questions come up, uh, I wanted to have him available. But um, as Rich mentioned, the CAFR uh, is, is not finalized yet. Um, we're waiting uh, for, for one of the uh, agencies that get blended in uh, to get that final report. So. As uh, soon as that happens, um, that'll, be, that'll be available. But the draft is, is out there and available. Um, so this is just meant to give you kind of a high level uh, review and then we'll address questions and certainly interrupt with any questions that you have. But uh, we have you know, gotten the audit put together, final, just about finalized and, and are prepared to issue an unmodified opinion, which is the highest level, it's a clean opinion. Uh, indicates no material misstatements were noted. Um, the Housing Redevelopment Authority is audited by other auditors. Um, that's, that is contained in the, in the overall audit. The rest of it we have audited. So it's uh, Metro Communication and Housing and Redevelopment Authority are, are those two component units, we call them, that are brought in. So no audit entries, that's good news. We have no material weaknesses to report, no significant deficiencies. So about as clean uh, a report as you can get. So that's all good. Uh, GASB 61 was new this year and was, was a, had to be adopted into the statements, but um, really didn't impact anything uh, because it, it just, redefines component units, uh, but in looking at that, it, it didn't, change, didn't change anything for, for your statements, same component units as before. Right, Brian? That's correct, yep. Okay. So, you know, that's sort of a look at the financial audit. Um, oh, I'd like to mention, too, that that CAFR, uh, which city staff prepare, has gotten uh, uh, the GFOA Achievement of Excellence Award for 33 years now, and we expect that that will continue. That's a Government Finance Officers Association certification. 
Um, so it's, it's, really, it's really kind of a plum for the, the city of Sioux Falls and, and the quality of that report. Wanted to uh, mention a couple of things that are coming up as far as changes in, in the future uh, that could affect those, some of those financial statements. GASB 67 is, is the one that will come into play in 2014. However, that really, I guess, is only impact, impacts pension plans. Uh, GASB 68 will, will come online in 2015. Now that one is, um, is going to be interesting because it's going to require governments to report a, li a long-term liability for net pension plan liabilities. So, and that's not, that's not ever been included um, on the statement of financial position before. Um, so that's, uh, that's coming. Um, it'll impact the government-wide statements. Uh, we're, we'll continue to uh, be available, consult on that, uh, but that's, that's not until 2015 that that is going to come into play. We also, um, as part of this, do a single audit um, for uh, covering federal financial assistance and all of the compliance rules that go along with that federal money. We tested four major programs this year and had no uh, material weaknesses or significant deficiencies over internal control to, to report for, for that either. So that's, so that's as good as that can be. Issued an unmodified, or will, issue an unmodified op opinion on compliance and on uh, internal controls over compliance. So you're in compliance as far as our testing indicated, our testing of your controls over compliance we're all clean as well. Had great assistance uh, and uh, cooperation from everybody. I'd like to, to thank Tracy and, and his staff and, and internal audit. Uh, so, Rich, your, your people are be, to be commended as are yours, Tracy, from our point of view. So uh, we appreciated that as, as auditors. I think... Uh, um, that covers the main comments. Brian, would you like to add anything at this point? I don't think so. I think you've covered everything that, that we would want to, to communicate to the audit committee, so I think I'm good for now. So that CAFR should be finalized. When do you think, Brian? Do you have an estimate? You know, we're really just waiting on Metro Communications, which I know that uh, that is about ready to go. That's one of those component units that you mentioned. The other one, the housing and redevelopment, which is the one portion that we do not audit. I know that one uh, is still being worked on. There is a draft of that. That draft, I believe, has been submitted or is very close to being submitted to the Department of Legislative Audit, which is a requirement, and they will review their report. So really it's it's waiting on that, that one that we simply don't have control over, and as soon as that one is, is ready to be finalized, then we can get, get everything else finalized. As far as the timeline, I, I certainly would anticipate uh, it being available to finalize within a week, but again, we're, we're waiting on that housing and rede redevelopment. Okay, thank you. And, you know, section two of that, of that CAFR is the financial section. If you've had a chance to go and look at that draft, that's where these financial statements are and where our, our report will be. Questions for Any Dean? questions for Dean or Brian? Rex? Yeah. Uh, Dean, significant deficiencies. No significant, but that doesn't mean that we're $100,000 off in one situation and it's too small amount of money <laughs> to... No. You might want to explain that a little bit because... You know, yeah, we throw those as our profession throws those terms around and assumes everybody understands them. And uh, you know, we have levels of of deficiencies to report. Material weakness being the worst, significant deficiency the next one, and then just something that's just a deficiency. Um, as far as as far as, as the auditing rules and as far as um, um, the government. Uh, 
auditing rules go, we're required to report if we have a material weakness or a significant deficiency. And we're talking about over internal control. Okay. Um, so that we're testing in your internal controls to make sure that they're going to catch errors or um, problems or, you know, uh, fraud, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, all of those kind of things. We're testing, and we, we didn't find those reportable weaknesses. Can I have one more? Yes, please. Um, and you, you mentioned in uh, 2015 um, the audit will have to include a <clears throat> uh, study on the pension plan and what we've got left is uh, does a firm like yours have uh, um, actuaries available to do that or will you that need to be farmed out? Well we don't have any actuaries on staff we have relationships with consulting actuaries uh, if that were to become necessary for this um, uh, I don't know if that's the case um, I think Brian what you want to jump in here? Yeah, I sure can. I, when it comes to actuaries, that's really going to be the responsibility of the city. And, and as Dean mentioned, we can, we can certainly refer actuaries to you. Um, but a lot of times, uh, that GASB 68, that pension standard that will be effective in 2015, a lot of times what that's going to cover that, that people aren't going, uh, or, or that maybe surprise people, are if there are statewide plans that employees participate in, so if there's uh, PERA plans or, or any statewide plans. So at the state level, you know, it's really from a, from a city perspective, the money is, is sent to the state, and then it's really forgotten about. And what's going to happen is the states are going to be required to have an actuary come in and determine what that pension liability is in total and then allocate that liability out to each participating government. So each government will receive a percentage of that, and that, I'm sure there'll be some, some formal reporting that will be done, but it will be to inform uh, the city as to here is your portion of the liability. You know, you need to then incorporate that into your balance sheet as a long-term liability, share this formal report with your auditors because they're going to be asking for it, so that's going to be where, where it's impacted uh, probably more uh, than at the city level. Uh, but then at the city level, if there are city-run pensions, uh, then the city would need to hire actuaries to calculate those and then incorporate that into the, the audit report. So we're going to need to budget for that probably next year because they're not – that's going to be over and above the regular – in 2015. It will be, yeah, it'll be a new – New thing. A new thing to consider. Because we will have to do that then, it sounds like, because we still have an active pension going in Sioux Falls, so we'll have to do it. Just something to keep in mind for, for the future on our budgeting. Thank you. Any other questions for Dean? Or? Uh, Dean, was there any uh, significant um, audit adjustments uh, um, that you recommended to finance? Or? No. Okay. There was, there was no audit adjustments. Dean uh, or uh, Tracy, did you guys uh, interfacing with the new uh, accounting software? Did that help? Hurt? Did that? Well, that's really 2014 now. Yes. Um, so we didn't Think deal with it much stuff. at all, mm. um, other than you know we always look at transactions during the first part of the following year for, to see if there's any liabilities or receivables that need to be recorded. But we did not deal with with the new software much we didn't look we didn't we didn't look at internal control uh, as it relates to the to the new software Ryan would you like to add, add some comment on that yeah maybe just expand a little bit really it, it, it didn't have uh, any impact uh, because we at, at, for the audit we're always looking back and so really what Dean mentioned uh, we will it will impact the 2014 audit and we are trying our best to stay ahead of that uh, try to carve out some time in, in the summer or early fall to go over to the city and gain a better understanding of how the new software works, the, the controls that are in place, because uh, those, uh, to my understanding, have, have changed a little bit and probably for the good. So it will impact 2014 much more than, than this most recent audit. Okay, that makes sense, too. 
Uh, anything else? All right, very good, Dean and Brian, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We don't need to vote on that, do we? No. <clears throat> like this. All right, very good. We'll move into our uh, review of the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Kim, I think that's yours? Yep, yep that's Kim's, so you, you can take it away. Sounds good. Um, was performed in audit of the Sioux Falls Convention and Vi Visitors Bureau bid tax. The bid district was established in October of 2010 with the tax being effective starting January 1st, 2011. This is the first audit we've conducted of the bid tax. The tax is, um, just to give a little background here, the tax is remitted to the city's finance department on a monthly basis. It's a self-reporting tax based on the number of rooms sold at a $2 per night per room charge. The city um, then collects a 1% administrative fee and the remaining balance is forwarded to the CVB. Um, the CVB is funded by both the bid tax and a 1% room tax. Um, this audit did only focus on the bid tax dollars. In 2013, um, the CVB received um, just over 1.6 million in bid tax revenue. Of that amount, approximately 30% is spent on program administration, which is mostly made up of salaries and benefits. The remaining 70% is spent on sales and tourism development. The CVB is currently staffed with 13 full-time employees, and we did um, compare that to similar size cities, convention visitors bureaus, and that seems um, very comparable. Our audit work included a review of the adequacy of accounting and management internal controls, as well as the adequacy of internal controls over expenditures, and a review to determine whether improprieties had occurred. And we also reviewed the CVB's performance measures. Um, we performed an overall reasonableness test on the bid tax revenue um, due to their self-reporting aspect. So to do that, we did um, test for the CVB's prior fiscal year, which ends 930. And our recalculation showed that based on the industry average occupancy rates that the bid tax that was collected for the year was reasonable within 15%, so we felt pretty good about that. We also selected a sample of 16 monthly remittal forms from various hotels in the bid district. Uh, we went out to those hotels and obtained copies of room reports and recalculated the amount of rooms sold. The only discrepancies we noted during that testing were very immaterial keying errors or human data entry errors. Um, we also selected 30, a sample of 30 expenditures to test, and this would be expenditures from the CVB, what they're doing with the funds after they receive it. During this testing, we noted um, all expenditures contained proper approval and noted no instances of misuse, duplicate payments, or extravagant spending. Uh, we did select one property to test that we didn't identified as individually significant. That hotel had not remitted bid tax payments in approximately 18 months. Um, we worked with the hotel owner and obtained room reports and were able to come up with an estimate on the amount due. So we've worked with finance on that, um, internal audit finance, and the CVB staff met with that individual owner last week, um, discussed the bid tax and the responsibilities with that. He has made a partial payment at this time. Um, finance department is going to continue to be in contact with him to establish a payment plan on the rest of the past due and um, he has verbally agreed to start making regular payments going forward. So it's a good result from the audit. Um, we had four recommendations that came from the audit. Um, we recommended that the finance department establish written procedures um, to kind of spell out the duties and responsibilities of the finance staff as well as the CVB staff. They, um, you know, they were there, just not necessarily formalized and in writing. Uh, management has responded and they've communicated expectations to their staff and the CVB and they will work to formalize these. Um, our second recommendation was that the finance department establish um, specific procedures to verify the accuracy of bid tax remittals, um, either through an analytical analysis similar to our overall revenue test on a yearly basis or to do random verifications such as we did during the audit to have a sample of hotels send in 
business records to support their remittal. And they are, I think, in the process of working on that or will work on that. They agreed with that recommendation. Um, the next two recommendations were more um, for the CVB staff. Um, we recommended that the CVB document procedures regarding the approval of the expenditures, and that was mostly just to document the procedures and then also to define what they consider allowable costs. Um, also to develop a travel and entertainment policy which outlines what's allowable for travel and local entertainment expenses when they're bringing people here. I think um, the response in here says they will take the necessary steps. I think Terry has done that already and she is here for questions if you have any. Um, the fourth recommendation is that the city and CVB should establish an agreement that requires the CVB to report certain performance based measures annually to the council and management and that the performance measures are relevant and easily understood. And again, that's going to be a collaboration between finance and the CVB staff to get those performance measures reported to you guys. So. With that, I would certainly open it up to any questions. And again, both Tracy and Terry are here. Any questions for Jessica? Uh, Councilor Aguilar. Yes, I don't know if this is uh, a question for Kim or whether it is for the finance department, but for results number one and two, are there these policies or procedures in place for other bid districts that are managed by the city? Tracy Turback with the finance office and the <clears throat> This one is unique. This bid district is unique because of the, uh, the, the tax that's involved. The other uh, bid districts are, uh, for, for example, the downtown bid district, those are collected through the, the county through an assessment process on property assessment. So, so we aren't directly involved in collecting those uh, in the way that we are with the, uh, the occupancy tax from the motels. So I think to answer your question, the, the policies and procedures are very different. So, um, but I think that's a good recommendation. It's something that we, we we're already working on with the attorney's office to, to establish some good procedures on uh, how to deal with uh, with collection issues when they do come up, or if reports are are obviously inaccurate. What what should our response be in terms of a policy or procedure? Go ahead, Another Jess. question. So with the other bid districts, that 1% administrative fee, there's no administrative fee with any of the other bid uh, districts? I, I believe that's correct. Thank you. Any other questions for Tracy or? Yes, Councilor Rolfing. <clears throat> Just um, one, I, on the uh, performance-based um, measures, or, yeah, to re establish those, <clears throat> can you help me with, excuse me, how those are, going to be established what criteria you have or maybe Terry can work work with that also uh, give me an info yeah I, I see that as being kind of a collaborative effort between the city and the and the CVB to identify those things that are measurable performance measures that we can uh, track and identify and report on uh, I, I thought that was a great recommendation in the audit that uh, the, the the city from an accounting standpoint we're just kind of a pass-through entity we, we take the money from the hotels and and turn it over to the CVB but we clearly have a, a vested interest it's a city levied tax uh, we, we the council has an obvious interest in understanding uh, what we're getting for that money I mean it's it's a lot of money that's passing through to market the community and and uh, bring visitors to town so um, it'll be a challenge I think some of those things yeah, and, and from your background, I'm sure you understand how do you measure the effectiveness of a marketing program? It's it's not an not an easy task to do, but I think it's a worthy a worthy thing to undertake. And and we'll be looking for for ideas if there are thoughts out there on on how to uh, tackle that. I'm I'm certainly interested in hearing ideas because that's a little bit outside my wheelhouse. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, <clears throat> See, Terry Ellis is here. Terry, did you have anything else you wanted to add as far as uh, response from the CVB? I just might add about that. 
Um, the CBB has done and will continue to do an annual report every year where uh, it's broken down as to how many groups we booked, how many room nights that's generated, what the economic impact is, et cetera, et cetera. We will continue to do that. We will also provide, um, in addition to the bigger report, we're going to bring it down to pretty much a summary page so that you'll easily be able to see uh, you know, what's been done last year, this year, et cetera, so you can compare those for room nights sold, groups sold, economic impact that it equates to, et cetera. And in working with other CVBs, most of them that, that we have talked to um, measure everything on how many room nights are sold because the room nights sold then generate the sales tax, you know, the bed tax, et cetera, et cetera. So if that makes sense. Terry, the, uh, <clears throat> the boundary or the district of these hotels, is it inclusive just of the city limits or is it, the, uh, is it outside the city limits? Just the city of Sioux Falls. So if somebody's outside the city limits, they're not participating, and, and if they're a certain size? Right? No, if they're outside of the city limits, they are not participating. But with, within the city limits, is it 40 rooms or, or greater? Yeah. Yes. So they have to have a... Although we often fill rooms outside the city limits. So that's something that perhaps in the future we may, you know, want to talk about sometime. Are we a Sioux Falls Area Convention and Visitors Bureau? And what would that area be? Or are we a Sioux Falls Convention and Visitors Bureau? And that's a whole great big topic for, I'm sure, another day. <clears throat> Anything else for Terry? Okay, uh, yep. Councilor Rolfing. Well, I just want to say thank you for the job you're doing uh, managing this money and um, it is making a difference, and it's doing what, what, what it was supposed to do. It is. And yeah. so um, let's keep, keep pushing it. Thank you. We'll do it. Okay, well, uh, I need a uh, motion to act on this to uh, accept this report. I'll move to accept the report. Second, Oppegard. Very good. We have a motion <laughs> made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, We'll move on to our next report, family daycare registration. I guess that's with Jessica. Yeah, it's her, her first audit. And uh, we also have, she'll go over the report briefly. And then we have representatives from the health department here. Um, if you have questions after, um, Jess discusses it. So. Okay, so um, we reviewed the family home daycare registration process that's overseen by the health department. And the last ordinance was put in place May 2012. So. For that ordinance, um, providers within Sioux Falls need to be registered or they must be registered if they're providing care in a dwelling occupied as a residence in Sioux Falls with 12 or less children um, of more than one family. So we did look at the registration process, the renewal process, as well as inspections. And the yearly renewals um, are done in about January, December or January. And if you are state registered, which is not required in the state of South Dakota, um, the renewal costs $25 to be the city registered. If you're not state registered, then it's $125. So putting that in the ordinance is, of course, um, promoting being state registered, which is always good. And they do have a lot. Um, the state registration is a lot more in depth as well. So um, currently in Sioux Falls, there's 340 plus active registered providers. And with that ordinance, the inspect there's two inspectors that complete inspections on the family home daycares. They do one prior to the provider opening. They do a second one within 30 days of the provider opening. And that's unannounced. And then they also do complaint-based inspections. Um, so what we were kind of looking at was the city's process relative to those inspections and making sure that the complaints are followed up on and documented. We were also looking at the management um, to determine if management is effectively monitoring that renewal process. And then we were also looking at how the city prevents those unregistered daycare providers because it is all self-reporting. Um, so we did find that, you know, to find those unregistered daycare providers, the inspectors go on 
social media sites like Facebook or Craigslist. And if they find one that's not registered in the system, they can call them up or you know go on site and see if they're if they have children. Um, I did do a ride along with one of the inspectors on a new facility inspection, and the inspector was great. Um, made sure that he was very thorough. He made sure that the provider understood what was expected of them being city registered. And then I also looked at their provider files to make sure that they were monitoring that renewal process. So one of the things that we did find was with this ordinance, if a provider was active prior to 2008 and if they have not had any complaints, it's likely that they've never had an inspection done on their, in their home dwelling. Um, so one of the recommendations that we did have was to have random inspections done on all active providers, whether or not they have a complaint or not. Um, but we do as an internal audit team understand the fact that with 340 active registered providers and you have two inspectors, you know, the, the likelihood of that being an option right now um, might not be that great based on staffing. And then our second recommendation, when doing the file reviews, there wasn't necessarily anything missing. It was just the notations of it missing. Um, so they have a checklist in the front of the file and what they're gonna do to make sure that everything is in the file that needs to be and everything is documented is they are going to add a few things to that file checklist as kind of a secondary file review to make sure that everything's in the file and everything meets what their policy and procedures say that it does, so. Um, those were really the only two audit recommendations that we had um, and management concurred, you know, based on those things, so. And then Jill and Alicia are here if you have any questions as well. But. Any questions for Jessica on the audit? Yes, go ahead, Arnie. Yeah, I was, I was just, I, I thought the recommendation to do the random test was, was a good idea and I know this, the staffing mm -hmm. could cause an issue, but one thing I was wondering is, I think you mentioned you encourage them to also be registered with the state. Do you know who does those, the, the state requires a random inspection every two years? Yes. Who, who does those? The Department of Social Service. So, so it seems like it would be beneficial if at some point maybe we required mm -hmm. state registration, then that random uh, review would be taken care of and then the city wouldn't even yeah. could rely on the state doing that. The one thing that we did see when looking at the state registration is you have to do a lot more classes. There's a lot more things that you have to do to be state registered. So the one thing that um, when I was talking to Luann Ford, um, it might discourage some of the smaller daycares from being in Sioux Falls because of all of the other things that they'd have to do on top of just being the city registered. So that would be the only thing that. Jill, thank you. Jill, would you like to add to this discussion? Jill Franken, Health Director, those um, comments around um, would it be a good idea to require state registration are certainly things that we have had lots of discussion about um, over the past several years. Uh, so certainly that is one consideration. It does come, um, will come with a lot of discussion we'd have to have with the state um, Department of Child Care Services or their Division of Child Care Services. We recognize that that would be um, something that would increase our workload significantly if we were to require state registration. So it's certainly one possible option, but it would also require a lot of collaboration with them as well. I also want to just point out, um, you mentioned that there's two inspectors that uh, provide um, or work within this area doing the um, child care registration renewals. Um, we also have other staff that assist with that renewal process as well. Our, our clerks um, do a fair amount of work with that. But um, those two inspectors are also responsible for a quadrant of the city with restaurant inspections. They also carry a load with nuisance um, complaint violations and um, doing those.